the heart of America, a land of even tempo, a land of mild traditions, a land that has kept its traditions of horse racing, ballad, song, story, and folk music, that is filled with bluegrass beauty that is not akin to poetry, but is poetry. Western Television, assisted by a grant from the National Endowment for the Humanities, presents... Kentucky's wealth of tradition derives partly from the fact that the state was once a kind of gateway to the West. It received many kinds of people from many places, north, east, and south, some just passing through in the great westward migrations, and some to settle down. All of these people brought their traditions with them, and even those who stayed a while and then moved on left their calling cards, some of which were the structures they built. Everybody knows about bird watchers, people who take their binoculars, even for a short walk, to see different species of birds. But not everybody knows about house watching or house looking, which can be either a pastime for a drive down the road or the serious study of historians, geographers, and folklorists. Pioneer builders set up their houses, barns, spring houses, and corn cribs according to the patterns of their environment. Unlike modern builders who rely on blueprints and modern tools to produce the housing of a technological age, the traditional builder used traditional tools and materials to make a structure very like the ones built by his foreparents. This is why the folklorist thinks of folk architecture in ways similar to the way he thinks of a folk tale or a country dance. Linda Pace, a student at Western Kentucky University, is collecting and studying some varieties of folklore. Since she is interested in traditional structures, she is fortunate to have guidance from Dr. Linwood Montell. He has specialized knowledge of traditional buildings and other folk arts. Isn't it generally accepted that the most common type of folk housing that was transformed or transferred from the old world into the United States was mostly a single pin house? That's very true, Linda, and this type structure is still very commonly found on the cultural landscape if we'll just be willing to get out and look for it. Mm -hmm. Do you recall the other day when we were out and we uh, came to this uh, log pen crib and we uh, were able to get some shots of it? Here's a very good example of what you'll see on the cultural landscape in Kentucky. First of all was the single pen crib and then this would be the single pen cabin, which we normally uh, associate with the occupancy of human beings. This structure, Linda, would be the two-story single pen cabin. What is the basic difference between a, a crib and a pen? Or are the terms interchangeable? Really, they are interchangeable. It's a matter of uh, choice of words, uh, actually. I think the main thing we should stress at this point, Linda, is that uh, th these terms come from a very old tradition and we can uh, talk in terms of a double crib barn, a single crib barn, mm -hmm. maybe a uh, double pin house, a standardized double pin house, and so on as it were. The main thing to keep in mind here really is that the single pin which is what we're, we're talking about right now. The single pin is the basic unit of all construction. And it doesn't matter whether we refer to it as a crib, as a pin, or what have you. The main thing is that this is a functional term and these structures which are built uh, on the cultural landscape are functional structures in that they do serve as housing either for human beings or for livestock. 
Now, let's look um, at our, one of our models and build this very simple structure known as the basic unit of all construction. And I'll let you uh, have the pleasure of building the chimney. Now, uh, Linda, what do you have here? Just a single penthouse. Just a single penthouse, okay. You have, uh, let's, let's, let's pretend a little. Uh, let's imagine that these are log walls, four log walls, sometimes with an attic, sometimes with just a small loft, but seldom ever with an area really capable of uh, facilitating human beings up in the loft area. So mainly it's just one basic room below with uh, a roof and with a rather large chimney. Do you recall the little house we saw, the little log house that had the, mm -hmm. uh, the large chimney and it had the uh, single front door and it had the roof which uh, over looked the front of the house and covered the porch. But these little structures that uh, you see so commonly on the cultural landscape were very, very functional in earlier times. Uh, I recall the uh, house we were just talking about. The tradition is that this little house served three generations. That is to say the three generations of, uh, of families grew up in, in this house. This is really fabulous to realize that in our day of affluency that uh, we do have not too far removed from us in time uh, uh, cabins such as we saw a minute ago. The families, of course, grew, and as they grew, there was need to have additional space. And it was a very simple matter, Linda, just to take another single pen, stack it on top of the original single pen. Now, I'll let you build another chimney, if you will. And so we have this. Now, do you recall what the term was, that, uh, what the name of this is? Oh, it would have to be a two-story single pen. Very good, a two-story single pen. Linda, do you remember the double pen structures which we saw the other day on the cultural landscape? I sure do. This we call an English half house. Nantucket Island House. Just a good shot of the cultural landscape. That was a transverse crib barn and another. This country was very attracted, uh, very attractive that is, to the early settlers who came into this area from North Carolina and Virginia and Pennsylvania. That's an eye house. We'll be considering this at more depth in a few minutes. Lovely country. Notice the small structure there by that large barn, and then this is a uh, fuller blown version of the same thing, the double crib barn. This is an ancient single pin cabin here in southern Kentucky, something like 160 to 180 years old. Notice the very interesting log end notches, the chinking between the logs. Also notice, Linda, the protrusion of the roof out over the front of the structure. This is typically Appalachian in uh, character. Would you by chance be able to identify this structure? Another double crib barn. Yes, a form of the double crib barn. Really, we refer to this as the English hay barn. This is a very interesting structure known as the four crib barn. Very uncommonly found in this part of Kentucky. How about this? A hall and parlor house. Very good, a hall and parlor house. Now, 
we looked first then at the basic unit of construction, which is the double pin. The, well, the single, the pin. single pin. And pin then first. we move then in the evolutionary stages to the double pin. So let's just uh, tear down the structure which we erected a minute ago and get out our carpenter tools and build a double pin structure. And you see how simply it is done. Just two single pins. Just two single pins, generally with an opening here, a breezeway or a hallway, uh, uh, termed different things by different people in different localities, of course. This double pin structure now can be uh, used to build barns or it can be used to build houses. Mm -hmm. Let's first of all, I think this will be the roof that we want to use here, yes. Now, if we uh, build a structure like this, is that even on That's that fine. side? Fine. This we would refer to as the double crib barn. Now, if on the other hand, you should take this same structure and stick a chimney here or add a chimney here or on both ends, then you would have a uh, house which we call the dog trot house. And we'll be considering that uh, in more depth in a few minutes. Also, if you would enclose the sides here, then what would you have? If you simply enclose this, this, this hallway. Then you would have the picture that we saw a while ago, the hall and parlor house. That's right, uh, assuming of course that there is a chimney. Now here is a good uh, depiction of the hall and parlor house. A very stately house, and yet a, a very simply constructed house, a very beautiful on the landscape nonetheless. It is a central hallway house. What is the function of the four crib barn? Well, the function really is to uh, serve as a housing area for livestock in the four main pens. Sometimes, by the way, these may be subdivided into two or more stabling areas. And then the upstairs uh, portion, which is normally referred to as the loft, is an area where they would store uh, usually hay, sometimes corn on the other hand. Well, where did it originate? Is it a European product or American? Or? Well, actually, Linda, this is not an easy question to answer uh, as to the origin of many of these structures. We do know that the basic ideas um, uh, undoubtedly did stem from Europe. But uh, as they came into this country through uh, the Pennsylvania German country and into the uh, Tidewater country and what have you, and found their functional fruition in the United States, then they, they tended to evolve into uh, almost different forms. Mm -hmm. Now, this particular structure, the four crib barn, actually was born, the best I can tell, over in the Great Valley of East Tennessee and uh, then came on into this area of Kentucky, though certainly never in any degree of abundance. Let's look now and see what this uh, structure looks like in its uh, model form by simply placing our models here again, getting them distributed properly. Now, what do you notice about this, Linda? Well, that it has two driveways in it and that it is just four single pins. All right, so four single pins, four distinct pins, and a driveway, as you mentioned, going from side to side and a driveway going from end to end. I think there's some, one more thing that I should mention uh, before we uh, get off the uh, subject of this four crib barn, and that is what would happen if you would close up this uh, side to side driveway that is by uh, making a stable out of uh, this area and this area, then you have the makings of a transverse crib barn, mm -hmm. which is, by the way, the most common barn found in this part of Kentucky. It's uh, the long rectangular uh, pen on this side of the driveway and one over here. And uh, as I said, this is the most common barn, and you can easily see by studying the floor plans how our common barn that we have today evolved from the four crib barn. Now there are many special forms of the double pin or the uh, double crib structure that I think we do need to consider uh, before we get away from this topic. So, now there we are, Linda. 
What house is this? Oh, that's a saddlebag house. And uh, how, do you, how do you know it's a saddlebag house? It's distinct because of its central chimney. Very good. Now, I, I, once more, we go back to the two-story single pin cabin, but mm -hmm. for a particular reason. This structure has an L addition to the rear, which you see here. And uh, also, you recall there was an open breezeway between the main part of the house and the L addition. And this is often referred to, perhaps incorrectly, as a dog trot. The dog trot uh, house really has to go from a front, uh, you know, from the front to the back and sit side to side. Here we are looking at the cultural landscape again, the hall and parlor house. Just a typical house found in this part of Kentucky. Here is the dog trot house. A very good model, by the way, a good example. Notice the rather large end chimney. There you were, walking through the breezeway <laughs> through the dog trot itself. Let's go back now. Before we consider the dog trot, though, we did look at the saddlebag. And let's, uh, I think it would be wise, perhaps, to build a saddlebag house if we can just leave the roof off. I believe our purpose can be better facilitated here. I put two chimneys together because in the saddlebag structure, the central chimney was a very large, I guess I like to use the word massive because it was a very massive thing. The central chimney served the fireplace in this room and it served the fireplace in this room. Now, many times uh, there would be a front door uh, in the area which I was pointing to here. You would go into that door and then either to the left or to the right uh, uh, from the hallway. Sometimes, however, the saddlebag house would have a front door in this pen and a fr front door in this pen, which meant then that this area was either boxed in and if it were boxed in, then uh, usually there was a little door in the older forms, and you could open this door and go back into there and find there a storage place for hoes and rakes and buckets and the things of this sort. On the other hand, I have seen one model, uh, like I described here, where the uh, stairway goes uh, up from the porch to the uh, second level. Once more now, we're looking at the saddlebag house, Linda. Now, tell me a couple of the characteristics which would make this house stand out above the others. Well, it has a large central chimney. Yes, and it's also how high? It's also a story in a, in a loft or a story and a half high. Very good, one story and one half high. Let's return by means of review to the dog trot house just for a minute. Now, keep in mind, the main characteristic here is the uh, are the chimneys and then the breezeway or dog trot which goes from front to back compared to this structure in which the breezeway extends from side to side and separates the back part of the house from the front part of the house and which uh, as I have said once is many times referred to as a dog trot but perhaps should not be called a dog trot at all. Let's uh, build a dog trot house now Linda. Okay. If you'll just remove those uh, chimneys. Now, but by way of review, what uh, structure is this uh, reminiscent of without its chimneys? The double pin barn. Very good, the double pin barn. Now, if you will, place your chimney on the end there. So the basic difference then between the double pin or the double crib barn is uh, simply one in which there's a chimney on either end because this breezeway that you see here, it is never floored of course in the case of the more recent barns you'll see and in earlier days it was not floored in the cases of the dog trot house. What house type would you have Linda if you enclose the dry breezeway there? It would have to be a hall and parlor house. A hall and parlor house, all right. Now, let's uh, suppose that our family has grown and we need more room and we uh, decide to 
simply raise the roof line, as it were, and build another cabin on the top of each of these, then what structure would you have? Oh, we'd have an eye house. An eye house, very good. Do you recall that day? Mm -hmm. <laughs> now, Linda, this is not an eye house. Uh, that we, we have this, of course, in here for a purpose to show the transition between the height of the uh, dog trot house, the cabin, and the eye house. That is, this is simply a story and a half in height, and it does show the evolution uh, upward of the house types. Notice the interesting log ends once more. And as we come around the front of this house, you'll see the stretcher wall, the weight supporting wall that divides this house into two separate rooms. This really could be labeled then a double pin standardized house. Notice uh, the joist and how they're placed into the uh, logs. And then the interesting chinking this is one of the uh, very relic features we have on the landscape here and the broad axe marks, very graphic. Now what type house is this? The eye house. This is the eye house. Notice the, uh, in this instance, the chimneys on each end. You'll notice too that this is an eye house with a central hallway, this rather small portico, which is characteristic of this type house. There's a good close-up of the brick chimney, which has been painted and, again, is a very fairly common thing to see these uh, bricks painted white, usually. A very stately house out west of town. What do you notice different, perhaps, about this house uh, as compared to the one we just saw? Well, you can see the Greek revival in the eye house in the fact that the two chimneys are closer together toward the middle of the house. Very good. The chimneys being paired on the ridge line. This does not, on the other hand, change the actual floor pattern of the uh, front rooms. Notice the rather large columns. You know, there are really many of these houses if we would just observe them around. This is a very ancient house in terms of its age, but it's well kept. I think it's something like 160 or 170 years old. Again, central hallway. Notice how the chimney is meshed in with the end of the house itself. This structure, Linda, is what we have been talking about, the one we were just viewing then, and that is the one that we uh, have here on the table in front of us, just removing the chimneys, and that would be the double crib barn. And in that case that we just saw, it was used as a smokehouse. Right. Why don't we build an eye house? All right, fine. Now, what have we done, Linda, in building an eye house from the structure we just had? We've just added another story to it. It's the same structure, okay. but two stories. Let's go back then in our um, summing up. And we have taken the single unit of construction. And we've doubled it, and now we've quadrupled it. Mm -hmm. And all we do is to place a roof on it. And if you'll just add the chimney here, over here is the chimney. And there we have one of the many, many forms of the eye house. Linda, we've reviewed some of the uh, basic house types and the evolution of the houses from the very minimal small crib or the single pen all the way up through the eye house. And this would include such things as the saddlebag, the dog trot, the double crib, and so on. Now, uh, 
By way of review then still further, let's uh, look at some slides and see if you can tell me quickly what uh, these would be. All right. Well, it's an eye house, and the shutters, as you can see, dress it up. And from this view, you can see a rear addition. Now, this is not an eye house because it doesn't have a full second story, but it does have two chimneys. That's right, and notice the two front doors. This is a good example of a double pin house. Now, this house isn't much different from the other eye house, except for the small portico. And this seems much larger and more massive, but it has the lines of an eye house. It is more massive, but what we see here is still the tra traditional form. Those great big classic revival columns do give it more character, however. Well, this one has two chimneys, but they're inside of the frame of the house. And this house doesn't have two full stories. You are probably right, but to be sure, we ought to have a look inside. Oh, this is certainly another eye house, and the main difference that I see is the porch that runs all the way across the front of the house. And this one is the same general shape, but the red brick chimneys are different. And this time, the porch extends only part of the way across the front. This view shows us also the shed addition at the rear, a fairly common embellishment. Well, a small log house, after all those eye houses. And this has a chimney on each end, and it has only one story. It's a double pin house with a large roof porch and a shed addition at the back. Linda, congratulations. You certainly seem to have the terminology well in hand, and we have reviewed here some of the basic structures for this part of the country. Folk architecture in Kentucky is a rich and varied heritage. Out on the Bluegrass Parkway or down almost any obscure country road, the traveler will find many examples of building traditions. Settlement patterns in some areas are clearly reflected by houses and outbuildings still standing. And the ingenuity of traditional builders who have made countless minor adaptations and decorative changes of basic plans challenges the observer to take a good look and see what has happened. Take along a camera and see if you can record a saddlebag house. It's a rewarding and relaxing way to see an authentic aspect of Kentucky's heritage.